as we were praying, I just want to be obedient to share this with you. This is not the normal course of operation for me personally, but I have a very strong sense that the Lord has led me to share with somebody in here, maybe several somebodies, that this is a time that you have been, maybe unbeknownst to yourself, caught in deep discouragement or headed down discouragement road. And it seems so real to you and so logical that your emotional response to what's going on in your life would be to feel like you're feeling. It seems logical to you that the decisions you're making, the actions you're taking, based on the circumstances you see, make sense. But I believe the Lord wants to encourage all of us and remind some of us in particular that this is not the time for you to walk by sight. Don't do it. It is the enemy. This is not the time to walk by sight because the more you go by what you can see, the more normal it appears, the more real it appears, and it is only real here on earth but in God's mind and heart and power, you are a citizen of the kingdom, and whatever is discouraging you is a lie. So it may be some rotten stuff, but it is a lie what you are believing the rotten stuff means. It may be a jacked up budget and a jacked up marriage and a jacked up walk with God right now. That is real, perhaps. But if you keep studying it, you will add a therefore to it. And the therefore that we add is, therefore, something rotten is going to happen the rest of my days. And therefore, there's no sense of trusting God anymore because look how that turned out. And therefore, I should just go ahead and get my relief any way I can get my relief. And therefore, to hell with all of it, be careful. The enemy is not necessarily the one behind everything that is happening, but he is the one behind those therefores. This would be the time to come away from fiercely studying what is happening by sight and to study what you cannot see by sight, and that is the promises of God. So I know you're tired. I know you're discouraged. This would be the time not to say, because I'm so tired, I won't be in his word. This would be the time I got to be in his word. Otherwise, what I see will seem so real and his word will seem so false that I will follow the enemy as a good disciple and not my savior who has called me to discipleship. Father God, in the name of Jesus, we come asking you to purge discouragement but we also are asking you to convict whoever it is you want to hear that word that it is now time to get up and get in that word in spite of the discouragement and to live as if your word is true, even if it doesn't look true. Lord, we know you've given us the power to do it. I pray for the will to do it in the name of Jesus. And we rebuke every lying, deceptive plan of the devil now over every mind and heart, over every interpretation of reality. And we pray that we would know the truth, and the truth would make us free, even if our emotions haven't caught up with it, to follow you in faith and to rejoice in you even in the midst of mess. In Jesus' name, amen. I want us to continue in our study of the Word of God today, and that is this series that we started a couple of weeks ago and that will continue until the second Sunday of September about the calling on your life. Purpose and calling will be two words that you have heard a lot and you will hear a lot in the uh, coming weeks. They are pretty much biblically synonymous. They are used kind of interchangeably call upon your life. Calling, not as, uh, uh, as we normally use in our regular cultural context, which is we think in terms of calling being your job. What's the job you're going to do in your life? And if you're a Christian, we think in terms of what's the job you're going to do as a Christian. 
and calling of something bigger than that. We do the job that we do because of the calling and purpose of our lives. And so we'll be studying in these seven, eight weeks that we've begun, what are the components of that calling? What does it mean? Last week we talked about how your calling is involved in. God has literally called us, not just invited us, not just suggested to us, but literally called us into intimate engagement with each other to stimulate each other to love and good works. Remember, we talked about that. Hopefully this past week you got together with your maturity partners because we're going to live as it we have been called to, not just a ministry to the whole wide world, not just a ministry of God to us, but a ministry to each other. And so we've set up, how many of you got the email, a weekly email with the maturity partner guidelines to suggestions for you? I, please, even if you're tired, would you put your hand up if you got that? Great. If you didn't get that, that means either that that was not something you wanted, and that's okay. We don't need your email address if you don't want it. But if you did want that, it means we don't have your email address, and we'd like to get that to you, all right? So we talked about that last week, and we'll be continuing on. It's as if we're looking at a diamond. You know how you look at a diamond, and it's beautiful, and it's sparkly, but the way it's beautiful and sparkly is from different angles, it looks a different way. It's the same diamond, but they're different prisms, and from a different angle, it looks like this, and from a different perspective, it looks like that. So we'll be studying this calling and purpose of our lives under the general heading of us as Christ followers or disciples. What has he called us to? What does it mean? Christ followers, some people, disciples, I think it means you kind of go to church a bunch, and we go to church a bunch, that's kind of what it means to be a disciple. We found out it's, and we're going to find out it's way more to it than just you go to church a bunch. Some people would say to be a disciple means I just got to find out what the uh, do's and don'ts are, the Ten Commandments and whatever else is in there, and try to stick as close as I can, doing the best I can to the do's and don'ts. And that's pretty much what it means to be a disciple. Find out the rules and regulations and live the rules and regulations. And that's a, certainly a part of it. The Bible talks about it. We, Jesus said, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. Those who love me, obey me. But that's one angle of looking at the diamond, and it's not representative of the whole thing. And so some people have shut it down. Discipleship just means find out what I ain't supposed to do and don't do it. And life is all about following Jesus by what I don't do. Other people have said, uh, to be a disciple, it means what you get to do in the church. You can't be a disciple unless they let you usher. You can't be a disciple unless they let you run a camera. If they ain't got enough cameras or if they already got somebody running the camera, then you can't be a disciple because they didn't give you a job in the church. So we think in terms of discipleship being activity that we do inside the walls of a local congregation when, in fact, I was saying this yesterday in Las Vegas, someone asked a question, and her question was along the lines of, how can I express my ministry and the call that God has given me when the thing that God has given me to do, they already got too many people doing it at the church, and the ones who've been assigned to do it ain't even doing a good job of doing it, so it's keeping me from my ministry. I said, oh my goodness, that means... You got a tiny definition of church. If you think the church is the place you go on Sundays, you know you pass 50 of them getting to this one. I have found out that according to the New Testament, we ain't going to church as much as we are the church, which means I'm taking the church wherever I go, which means if there ain't room for me to express my ministry here, I'll come here and study the word, fellowship, hug y'all and pray for you like we did, and I will do my ministry outside the walls of this church because all of it inside these walls and outside these walls is headed up by one king, and his name is Jesus. And that means you are in his sovereign jurisdiction, whether it's up in here and Ron gave you a job to do, or you are up in here and Ron don't know nothing about it, but Jesus does, and you are doing it out there. So grab a ministry in here. If you see one that grabs you, say no to one up in here and grab 10 of them out there and let God use you beyond just discipleship means what I do at New Dawn. Some of us come to New Dawn, I come to New Dawn, and when I come, I come to work and worship. Some of us, you ain't got to work, you came to worship. Some of us came in here, it is mostly to receive. Some of us came in here, it's mostly to give. Let the giving, receiving, or whatever it is that you do in here, whatever the rest of it is that discipleship means, do it here or do it outside of here. Just do all the components, all the facets of that diamond. You with me?
So we're going to talk about that. It is not just, as some would say, discipleship is what I do for you. It means our accountability. And certainly that is a part of your maturity partnerships that you started last week. I really hope if you didn't join us last week that you will get in on that. Your growth is going, your spiritual maturity and growth is going to be limited in some ways by not the extent to which you hear good sermons, not just the extent to which you uh, read good teachings and best-selling books about Jesus, but you will be limited if you squander any component of the growth plan that God has used for us, and the growth plan includes ministry from each other. It really does. Intimate engagement with each other. So please, get in on that one. You could eat really well, but if you are deficient in one vitamin, it could be enough to put you in the hospital, even if you got all the other nutrients at high quality and great consistency. Don't you walk around here anemic for lack of one component of what it means to be a mature disciple. So this week, we're moving on to talk about another component of it. There'll be uh, five of them that we'll be sharing and lots of subset components under all of them. So before we move forward, uh, I want to commend you to be on the lookout for your email or to make sure that you drop in the offering basket at the close of this service, your email address. On Mondays, I have promised to make sure that you get some suggested guidelines for how you and your maturity partner can engage together. How many of you got together uh, on the telephone or in person with your maturity partner this week and used those guidelines? Fantastic. Let me hear from one or two of you, two or three of you. How did that go? What were the blessings and challenges of that? How did it look? How did it turn out? What went on? Who's here? Ro, did I see your hand go up? Real loud. What, 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 did, what did it look like? I mean, uh, volume, you don't have to say it. Um, and it was good. It was really good to see the outline that was laid out, and we had a time to encourage each other. Yeah. And it just felt, you know, it felt good to see the growth and the maturity that they're going to Excellent. 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 How many of you would say, and I'm going to get to some of your other ones to report how it went, how many of you would say, it felt a little shallow to start out with? It was good. We went through the thing, but it wasn't real, real deep yet. I mean, put your hand up. Say, it wasn't real, real deep. Nobody shared no secrets yet or this and that. Great. Shallow is wonderful. The best way to get out to the deep part of the ocean is to start on the beach and go through the shallow. If you figured out a way to go from the beach out to the deep without passing through the shallow, fine. That means you're able to do miracles. But I assure you, you can get to the deep water if you are willing to pass through the shallow. Sometimes we can get to the deep water better. Don't put me out in the deep water yet because I'm not acclimated yet. It's too cold to me. I need to get used to it. I need to tiptoe. You know how you do when you go down to the beach, first you tiptoe in. I'm all hot and now it's cold and I got to shiver a little while. I got to consider whether I'm going to go forward or go back. I got to think about maybe that's enough. That was enough for today. Got my feet all wet. I'm refreshed. I'm going to dip down, put a little on my forehead and I'm going back to lay down on that towel. So there comes this turning point. Am I going to go further? Because this is chilly and cold. But the only way that the new temperature sets in is that you stay in the water. And for many of us, if I got to start in the deep water, I ain't going to stay there very long. But if I get to mess around a little bit in the shallow water, get to put a little water on my head, get to look around, see how some other people are doing it, get to think about, oh, this would be nice if I had a saltwater swimming pool, then just kind of inch my way down a little bit, and then stand here and go, look at me, I'm a bad boy, I'm in deeper water, that's all the way up to my uh, knees at this point, <laughs> and I'm still putting up with it, look at me, I've just got that aquatic thing, I might be in the Olympics, I might step out there another step, and before you know it, The temperature of the beach is no longer the temperature of your body. Before you know it, it's the temperature of the water that you have adjusted to. And going to the deep ain't no big thing if you took enough time in the shallow getting your temperature readjusted. 
So that's all right if y'all talked about where you got your pedicure and where you got your manicure. And that's all right if you talked about, ah, uh, the Lord has shown me specifically that what I need to do this week is uh, uh, prepare for heaven as if every day counts. Real generic, superficial, shallow stuff. Now, if six months from now we are still talking about prepare for heaven as if every day counts, then that means we're still on the beach. And that's not uh, the uh, a wise way to do it. That's the trifling way to do it. And we want to undo trifling and do wise, bold, and courageous. But start shallow to go deep. Anybody else? How did it go for you? Yes, Stella, you and your partner. Is your partner here? Okay, name her or him. Renee. Hey, partner Renee. Stella, how was it? Yep. Excellent, excellent, excellent. Wonderful. She said, we all had a good time. And some of the times you get together, it will be a good time. You will just feel so understood and so encouraged. And you will feel as if there's somebody intimately with you in your life and partnered, empowered, and supported. And other times, you will get on each other's nerves. One of you will talk too slow. And one of you will talk too fast. And one of you is hogging up the time. And one of you ain't telling me nothing. And one of you gets in the other face about something that is or is not happening in your life, and you will not want to hear it, and you will stay in the water, because that's exactly how Jesus does it. If we stay close to him, you'll notice that there will be days that you enjoy it, and you feel him, and it was just so wonderful. We enjoyed each other. I had to pull myself away from prayer, and there will be other days where I couldn't stand it. All I was trying to feel good and rejoice and shout, and all I felt was convicted about something I needed to tighten up. Or all I felt was tired. Or all I felt was bored. And that's fine. That's how all intimate relationships work. We stay together through whichever way the water is flowing. Good. Anybody else? What you got? How was it? Yes, ma'am. Sister Bunny. Great, it was imperfect, uh, in person. Partners. Do you hear what she said? She said, I, I, I told my maturity partner, I am laying down my ministry hat. I'm laying down, I mean, not my ministry hat, my counseling hat and my teaching hat. This is one of the most prolific counselors and teachers in the whole wide world. And some of you may have gifts and abilities like that. Don't come in there with your little shingle and your per hour rate card laid out there. Don't come in there as reverend, doctor, minister, evangelist, mother, supervisor, juridical prelate. Just come in there as scooter, Bubba, Sister Gal, Keisha, whatever, just be two peers and partners. Let them be able to get in your face. Well, they know the word way more than I do. Then with that little tiny portion of words you got, all I know to tell you is, uh, Jesus wept. Then just remind me that Jesus wept and keep reminding me because it is not a competition or a comparison. It is a partnership. The best partnership is where everybody bring what they got and everybody ain't got the same amount of anything. All right? One other. What you got? Yes, ma'am. Ah, sisters. Excellent. Excellent. What happens is with people that you're already friendly with, and I'm hoping you're already friendly with your sister, yeah, the people you're already friendly with, we can, and particularly with family, we can set into a certain groove. And with your family, a certain way we say hello, and it's a certain way we check on each other, and it's a certain little conversation that you have with your mama or your daddy or whatever, and we have that same conversation over and over again. So it can be frequent. It can be consistent, but it may have stopped progressing anywhere years ago. Because there's certain stuff you might tell a stranger that you ain't necessarily going to tell your sister. And there's certain stuff you might tell a stranger, but you ain't going to tell your mama because you feel pretty sure you know where your mama going to go with that. She's been saying that since 1973, so you know. 
that she's going to use this as an opportunity to tell you like it's a rhema word from God for today when it's the same word she's been telling you. You didn't want to hear it in 72. You sure don't want to hear it today. So stay on it because as we follow these guys, what can happen is instead of it, us being limited by our familiarity with each other, our familiarity with each other can become a platform for us to have deeper intimacy, deeper fellowship. And boy, how much easier, at least theoretically, it could be to get out into deep water when you already got the platform of relationship with a friend or family member. So we want to get the goods of it without the kind of paralyzed, stuck, same old, same old thing that can come from your maturity partner being your friend or family member. Can I hear from, oh, I think my blood pressure would just go down, just one brother who would say, I'm a brother who this past week, me and my maturity partner got together and we did the thing. I, need, I love hearing it in uh, soprano, but I sure need to hear it in tenor from somebody, please. Is there one? Is there one? Oh, thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. God bless you. Great. The last minute might be the perfect minute. Yeah. It's how you can get your rhythm established. This week it was kind of weird. We don't do this. And there's a little paper I got to look at. Do we use the paper? Do we don't use the paper? Oh, my goodness. I don't, we don't do this. You continue with this. The things we do on a regular become the new normal so that it will feel weird not to do this. So don't worry about it. Let it just feel just as weird. That may be some of what the fellowship is about is how weird this feels, how strange this is. And we'll spend our time talking about how strange is it to you and how strange is it to you and how weird was it for you. And that's just fine. Continue on. You will be getting that email uh, by Monday nights every week. Lord willing, that's my plan to have that to you. And it is suggested guidelines. Use as much of it or as little of it as the two of you choose to use. But replace it, if you replace it, replace it with something better than what's on there. Okay? And that's fine. Let the Lord use you. I, uh, and, and then also another component of that was we have committed, several of you made the commitment that you would be here for un, every Sunday until the second Sunday to hear the teaching, the next component of the teaching, or if you cannot be here, that you would watch the DVD or listen to the CD, which comes to you, uh, or, or a link to it every Monday as well, all right? So please, please, please get it here, get it there, but so we can continue on together on the same page. Let me take a minute. The Bible talks about giving honor where honor is due, and oftentimes honor is due to people who don't want you to give them honor, and yet pastors get to do that anyway. It's just one of those things pastors get to do. Oftentimes when we talk about giving honor to whom honor is due, they talk about some preacher, some pastor, some reverend, some somebody who's already got a bunch of honor, because if you got the microphone and everybody got to shut up while you talk, you already got honor. But oftentimes those who are behind the scenes, we don't think of it as giving honor to whom honor is due. I have a partner in ministry, among the partners in ministries that I have at New Dawn Christian Village, and there are many, and it takes many to do this ministry. I have a partner in ministry, and I see her one day a week. I have a partner in ministry whose face I see for about two hours on Sunday morning. That's it. Lots of emailing back and forth. That's it. I don't even hear her voice because we do so much emailing. But the ability for God, what's on God's mind to get into my heart, to get into my mind, to come out through my pen, get onto paper, and end up in your inbox is because God has given me a partner who gets those maturity partner emails out to you. Her name is Patsy Nelson, and she is my partner in ministry to make it happen. Patsy, where you at? Right back there. Getting sick of her pastor for calling out. Just stand up real quick and sit right back down. I want people to see. Yes, indeed. Thank you for your faithfulness. I'm just hauling off with a vision like pastors do, saying, yep, every Monday you'll get it. And I'm just thinking, Patsy, I'll send it out. I had no idea, because my memory ain't good like that, that Monday is Patsy's day off. I send her emails all day on Monday. I don't know that it's her day off. I don't know whether she read them Monday or Tuesday. Once it's out of my head, I'm good to go. What she is doing is she is putting in time on Mondays, her day off, to make sure that my vision of you having that on Mondays happens. 
And I appreciate that kind of partnership in ministry. Let's continue in the word of God together. Your number one calling in life is what I want us to talk about today. Your number one calling in life. You go, wait a minute. The number one does a lot of things. If you think in terms of being a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ and a disciple, a Christ follower, what comes to your mind as from the word of God, clearly we have been called to. What can you think of? Been called to, what, what's on the list? I have been called to. It comes up dozens and dozens of times in the New Testament. You have been called to holiness. You have been called to this, called to that. What can you think of? Uh, called to love, absolutely. Comes up over and over again, Old Testament, New Testament. You've been called to love. Be imitators of God by loving like Jesus, Ephesians 5.1. Anybody else? Service. Yes, you've been called to service. Yes, uh, you have been predestined for good works. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 2, that have been prepared, pre-carved, specified, and customized to you before you was even born. Good works. Anybody else? Service. Yes, mother. Call to obedience, God. Call to obedience, God. I just was going, if you, I'm glad you called because I was finna be obedient, obedient to what felt good to me. And yet Jesus says, if you love me, then I'm calling you to obey me. I'm showing you how to do it because I fooled around and did it myself. I only do what I've seen the Father do. My meat is to actually do, not just think about, not just aspire to, but actually decide and do the will of the Father. So yes, now he says, imitate me, live as I live. We have been called to obedience, to service, to uh, love. What else? To teach, yes, teach. It says in 2 Timothy chapter two, uh, those who have been taught well, this is a paraphrase, Teach well to others the things that you have received. The Apostle Paul, uh, a mentor to Timothy, his mentee, says the things you've received from me as I've taught you, just be blessed by it. Nope. He said the things uh, that you received from me through my teaching, you better make sure you teach it to somebody else. What else have we been called to? Yes, Leslie. To make disciples. I've been called to reproduce. I thought the paid personnel was supposed to make that happen when they give the invitation to the church, open the doors of the church, extend your hand as you extend your heart. Yep, that's one way that the paid personnel get to do it. But what about you? You make your money from SMUD or you make your money from Sony Studios or you make your money from the state of California. How are you supposed to reproduce? It means that there are a thousand and one ways that we fulfill our call and one of our callings is to make disciples as bold witnesses for the sake of making, reproducing new disciples. Anybody else? That's part of what you're doing in your partnership with each other, increasing each other's discipleship. Stella? To support one another. To support one another. Yes, literally even in practical ways. Practical way. Support one another. You mean by giving uh, a word from the Holy Spirit. Uh, uh, I got to stop you. The Lord has given me a word of knowledge for you. Yes, that's one way to support one another. Teaching one way to support one another. Uh, what about your mama died and we brought a bucket of chicken and a red velvet cake over? Another way that we support one another. What about you are short this month. You uh, went with Pastor Ron to Las Vegas to the purple women's conference and you knew you didn't have the money to go to that and pay your rent, and somebody, your maturity partner says, got you covered, then you, you $50 short, I'm going to hook you up with that $50. It's support of one another. Support. We're called to such. Yes, Sister Bunny. Hope. We are called in hope. Called in hope. And he talks about, he talks about the fact in uh, the New Testament that literally part of our calling is not just what we do, it is what we are hopeful of in Christ Jesus. We are called to hope. That's why a little earlier when we were talking about discouragement and all that, be very, very careful because spend too much time in discouragement means you ain't showing up for your calling. What's your calling? One of them is hope. That means discouragement got to keep up with me because even while I'm depressed, even while I'm tired, even while I'm frustrated, I am hopeful. Sometimes that's all you got is hope. I don't see nothing looking beautiful up in here. Uh, I don't see nothing looking like the fog is going to break anytime soon. I don't see nothing that looks like I'm even going to respond in a holy way to this mess. Then how are you getting up and not slitting your wrists? One thing, I am living my calling. Which calling is that? The preaching. No, I've been doing more cussing than preaching. Which calling? It is the calling to hope. I am hoping in an invisible God that he's not a liar. 
I don't know how he's going to be true on this, but I know he's not going to lie. And even if my emotions can't keep up with the hope, I'm going to drag myself by the collar in hope, even if my emotions got to catch up later. Good. So with all those things, those are really Jesus-y looking things. Yes. Worship. Yes, we are called to worship. Present your bodies a living sacrifice. Romans 12, which is your reasonable service. He said, I don't just want your emotions. Oh, I felt the Holy Ghost all over me. My emotions was down, so I rejoiced in the Lord. What about when you don't? What about when your emotions ain't there? What about when your body ain't there? My body tired. I, re- I worship the Lord sitting in this seat. What about when the, you, you're not in the uh, prescribed worship place? I don't need to wait till we get over here to some high school to worship him. I don't have to say holy stuff that you could hear. I don't have to say unholy stuff you can hear. I can worship him because that word worship is a word that means everything I do because he's worth it. Sometimes just getting up in the morning and continuing is your worship. I could have stayed in this bed and said to hell with all of it. And I got up. I still said to hell with it, but I got up <laughs> and I kept moving forward. And, ooh, did the Shekinah glory come upon you? No, it did not. If it did, I did not feel no Shekinah glory. Did you issue forth in other tongues? I did not. I didn't even speak in English today. Don't ask me nothing. I don't have nothing to tell you. Then how did you worship God if you didn't anoint yourself with holy oil, if you did not do a ceremonial cleansing, if you did not uh, uh, sing the song, if you did not lift up holy hand, put the left one first and then the right one, if you did not get with the praise team, how did you worship him? Sometimes just by by following him. Sometimes my worship was something I could have said yes to, and I said no to it. I felt lonelier by saying no to it, but I still said no to it. It would have momentarily felt good, especially when I'm frustrated and discouraged, to have said yes to it. So I didn't say yes to it, and I'm still frustrated and discouraged, and I worshiped him by saying no to something only on account of him. Why? Because he is what? Worth it. Therefore, that's my worship, because he's worth it. Be careful. You have criticized your worship too long, acting as if some of the most worshipful stuff you've done, you have acted like that's something you did on your off hours, and that wasn't worship. You stayed in the marriage, because there was no biblical ground for you to get out of it. There was a long list of earthly reasons for you to book up long time ago. But there was no biblical grounds. So you mad at your mate, miserable down in your soul, mad at God sometime for having to be up in this mess. And yet there is a joy in the spirit of being able to go, Lord, I love you so much that if one of us got to take the pain and one of us gets the pleasure, I just worshiped you by voting that you get the pleasure and I will take the pain. I didn't have to go around here and talk about, in the name of Jesus, this marriage shall be healed. No, in the name of Jesus, please, Lord God, fix this thing. Or in the name of Jesus, show me how I can be a better Christ follower with an unfixed thing. Either way, I can worship you. On the other side of the marriage was transformed. I'm going to worship you. I don't care. Fly time. Fly time is going to start at 6 o'clock in the morning. I'm going to be up in here worshiping you if ain't nobody's up in here. But I can worship you even if I'm still in it. So be careful. You, you limit that list of ways that you've been worshiping him. You'll be right where the enemy wants you to be, feeling that you are a knucklehead Christian who ain't about nothing. And because you missed two Sundays and quit missing them Sundays unnecessarily, but because you missed two Sundays, that means you didn't worship him. No, there's a whole bunch of ways in between the Sundays to worship him. You don't even work out that way. Yeah, I worked out in January. Right after Christmas, I gained 10 pounds. First week of January, I worked out every day. Well, you know it's August now, right? So it is an ongoing lifestyle. So with all those things we talked about, what could possibly be your number one calling in life? Your number one. Look what it says in Ephesians chapter 1. Look up on the screen. I love this translation, Ephesians chapter 1. Please take notes in your journal. Doodle, draw pictures or whatever. It is a part of the maturity process, I assure you. We're going to talk about that at another time. Ephesians 1 verses 4 through 5. Long ago, even before he made the world, underline that, long ago before he even made the world, God loved us 
and chose us in Christ to be holy and without fault in his eyes. Do you get that? Before he made the world, he called you, chose you, designated you. Before you was even created, he designated us as those that he chose to love. He loved us before he commanded us. He loved us before he created us. He loved us before there was a planet for him to put us on. It says in Ephesians chapter 1, long ago, even before he made the world, God loved us. Which, well, that's talking about something he did. Exactly. We have been called to something. Now, number one thing, all the way from the jump, before all of this stuff kicked off, is to receive from him his love. It is a part of his purpose for our lives. Not just us obey his commandments, and that's part of the purpose. You've been called to it. Not for us to just hope in him. Hope is part of it. All that stuff we said, teaching, serving, sacrificing, imitating, obeying, trusting, sharing, all of those things are calling. He said, what's first? What was from the jump before you even got here created us because he loved us and chose us in Christ to be holy and without fault in his eyes. His unchanging, one translation says, or many of the translations says, his eternal plan, which means it's always been the case and always will be the case, his eternal plan has always been to what? Adopt us into his own family by bringing us to himself through Jesus Christ. And this gave him great pleasure. What a mouthful. We often feel as if his pleasure, when is it that I most feel uh, the pleasure of being called into relationship with God. Oftentimes, our sense of the pleasure of it is because of something we did. If I avoided sin, I, oh, they give me, I'm proud of myself, as well we should be. If I served faithfully, if the teaching went well and the teaching didn't go funky, if the teaching was accurate instead of inaccurate, Oh, that gives me pleasure. This Bible says we have been called into something that is first and foremost before we ever even got here, not about our pleasure. It says that we were created in him. It talks about in Colossians and in other places in the New Testament. All things were created by him, for him. They are held together and maintained through him and were created, lest ye forget, for his pleasure. Some kind of way, choosing you and me, calling us into all these callings, started with the great one. The beginning of it for him was, I have called you to be those who are recipients of my love. What am I supposed to do in that? Be a recipient. What does a recipient do? What does a good recipient do? What, what do you see? Academy Award winners, when they win the Academy Award. Now, most of them win the Academy Award. They are millionaires. They are among the most famous people on the planet. They have huge influence. When they receive the Academy Award, how many checks do they start writing up there on the podium? And how much of that influence do they start using to change the whole wide world? They are recipients of something big and valuable. And what do they tend to do? Take that golden little statue in your hand and say thank you. Too long till they start having to play music over you to shut you up. If they continue, the first response is for a recipient is to do what? Receive. We get real deep. Oh, Lord God Almighty, now that I have received your love, I got to get out and make sure everybody else does it. Yes, that's part of it. I got to go out and make sure that I become a mature believer today. Yes, maturity is a part of it. What's the first thing? The first great calling is he has called us to be recipients of his love. A good recipient, best thing to do is to first shut up, open up your hand, and receive the good thing. Don't you hate that? Trying to give somebody a birthday present. You ever had that happen? And you're all excited about giving them the present or a Christmas present, this and that. You've envisioned how they're going to respond. And you've seen in your head they're going to cry. And they're going to be shocked like that person on the job who turned in a grievance about you. And they don't know that you know it was them who turned in that anonymous grievance. And you had, it came up and they, they brought you before HR and all that. And they don't know that it's your best girl or your best boy working in HR. And they came 
came and sang like a canary and told you who turned the thing in. And you said, I'm going to freak them out. I'm going to bless them this Christmas and I'm going to give them something I know they don't expect it. And you get the gift and you see in your head that they're going to be broken and wounded and they're going to stop and cry and they're just going to go, I just don't know what to say. I don't know what to say. And you come to the Christmas party and everybody's exchanging gifts and you can't wait. You come up on the one who was your worst enemy there sitting at the cubicle next to you and you go, ah, oh, I just wanted you to know I am a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ and the Lord put it on my heart. Whatever has happened in 2013, I am looking forward to something different in 2014 and I got this with you in mind. And they say to you, hold on a minute, hold on a minute, look like we've run out of punch and I'm in charge of the punch. And they grab your little gift and run to serve punch. Well, it was their gift. She got it for them. But the first thing you wanted to do was not to fixing the punch, not the thing. First thing you want to do is open up your hand and take this thing. What if that's what God says? We stumble over that point. We want to do for him instead of be with him because the people that you deeply love, we want to be with them. The people that we're a little bit scared of, the people that we want to get something from them, we feel obligated to do stuff for them first and foremost. I got to hook God up because I'm going to need him next week. So I got to make sure I hook him up. That's why we end up saying dumb stuff. Like, uh, you know, like the Bible say, when blessed, well, praise goes up, blessings will come down. Translation, I got the blessing button. And the way you hit the blessing button is praise him. And if you praise him a half a truckload of praise, you're going to get a half a truckload worth of blessing. If you praise him with a teaspoon, you're going to get a teaspoon of blessing. The Bible says that, and everybody says amen. Which Bible said that? Not the one we teach from. But it gives us this idea that as recipients, what came before the receiving is us doing. And it is a lie of the enemy. Our doing comes because we are just such overwhelmed, dumb, struck recipients of his love that after I have collected myself and after I have just said, I can't believe you did that. I don't have to go to hell and, and it's because of my sin and I'm still, you know I'm still sinning, Lord, right? Even when I try, you know I'm still doing it and I get to receive of your love on a daily basis once I receive, once I'm in awe, once I have wrapped my brain around my first calling is to be loved by him. There's all kind of stuff I can do after that. Once I figured out that Eladrian is really into me, it ain't politeness. We dated. I wonder if she's just being polite. She's a good Christian, so I doubt she would just say, I just ain't feeling you. So I was wondering, I was pretty broke, pretty young, pretty poor. So if she don't like me, I need her to say it, because these dates, I ain't got a lot of budget for these dates. So I need, just for the sake of cash flow, if you ain't feeling me, please tell me quickly. And yet I wondered, does she love me? She kept showing up and she sure looked fine when she showed up. She engaged in conversation with me. A couple of times when I reached out for her hand, she grabbed my hand back. But I often wondered, because it seemed it was a whole bunch of others that thought she was a cutie and a whole bunch of others thought she was the woman of God and a whole bunch of others said, the Lord has shown me you are my wife. Well, I'm thinking she can't be all of our wives. We not going to share. So the big question for me was, does she love me? When the time came, we're out of nowhere. I got this phone call. I'm trying to drop hints. I'm talking about, I really believe the Lord can make it where you're my wife. I'm feeling something inside me. I avoided the L word, but I would say stuff like, I'm feeling something I ain't never felt before. I could see us having a future. Read between the lines and tell me that you love me because I have now done all the stuff. I took you on expensive dates and then when I was broke, I took you to the beach and said, I was going to take you to Morton's for dinner, but I wanted you to see God's handiwork is better than Morton's and I could afford it a little bit better too. And I got a phone call one day where she said, I want you to know something. I can tell you are interested in me, and I hope you've seen I am interested in you, but lest you be in doubt from the first day you took me out, I said, I would love for that guy to be my man that becomes my husband. That means there was some love from her to receive 
Even before I took her to Starbucks and before I took her to Morton's and before I took her to the play and before I did all that stuff, if I knew from the jump there was a whole bunch of stuff that would have been even better if I could wrap my brain around being a recipient of her love. What if God says everything you try, all them other callings I ju- you just spoke about, every last one of all them other ones, that's good. Yeah, you should be obedient. Yes, you should. And if it costs you, that's how you grow. I, Lord, I just get so lonely, though. So there are some things I do. I don't do them every weekend, Lord. But every now and then, my heart just gets so lonely. And some of the anti-loneliness strategies I use, yep. Uh, I used to call them errors, mistakes, or a generational curse. Now I'm just calling them plain, flat-out sin. I know it was sin because when I drove over there, I said, Lord, you know I love you, right? You know I'm down with you. You know I'm going to sing in the praise team. I'm going to run the camera tomorrow. I'm going to usher at the door. Translation, I'm about to go do something low down. Please give me a two-hour window of opportunity. Don't go with me. Catch up with me tomorrow when I start singing Break Every Chain and catch up with me tomorrow when I am telling them about my maturity partner. But right now, just hook a brother up, hook a sister up, turn and bless Sister Bunny, Letha, Stanley, bless them. I'll run this. When I get back, let's just get back together and rejoice in fellowship with one another. But now my new groove is now that I know you love me, Loneliness and horniness and insecurity and doubt and emotional upheavals are now, because I know I got somebody that loves me, I still mess up, but I am so turned on by knowing that I am called, first of all, to your love, that it makes me make choices that I can't believe I made those choices. My jaw is still dropping. You mean I could have stole this money from the job? It ain't no whole lot of money. And Lord knows, uh, back in the day, I would say, all the overtime I put in up in here and all the headache they have given me, all the money these fools have made on my back treated me like a Hebrew slave. They owe me this money. This ain't me cooking the books. This ain't me raiding petty cash. This ain't me taking my family out to Sunday dinner and writing it up like it was a business meal. This is me just kind of reconciling the books. I now know this is thievery. And Lord, we ate spam on Sunday. And I could have cooked the books, used the petty cash, but there's something about knowing that you love me that makes me want to sacrifice, obey, and depend upon you like never before. So don't snooze that first calling on your life. Long ago, even before we made the world, he loved us and he chose us in Christ to be holy and without fault in his eyes. You know he means business because he's the one who hooked it up for us to be holy and without fault in his eyes. You ain't holy without fault yet. I'm not holy and without fault. But he's got some kind of vision thing. It's not a vision problem. It is a vision blessing. And the blessing is that when he looks at us, he sees in us the righteousness of Jesus Christ. It doesn't mean that he's got dementia. It doesn't mean that he's nearsighted and can't really tell that though he has given us Christ's righteousness, he just didn't know that I'm still sinning. No, he knows that. It means that he chooses us to love us and to conform us into the image and likeness of his son. And he chooses to look at us from an angle where we look more like Jesus than we look like rotten Ron. We do it all the time. You know how if you stand under a fluorescent light and you're getting ready to go to a fancy uh, uh, dinner, a fancy event where you really want to look your best when you went to the prom on your wedding day or this and that, you get too close up in the mirror after a certain age, you get too close up in the mirror and you are going to notice some stuff that you said, oh my God, I didn't even know that was all down in there. You, you will know if you ever gone to get a facial. One time I went to get a haircut and they had a new uh, eyebrow pluck, plucker and facial 
giver. And they said, we're just giving everybody facial. I said, I, I wash my face. I'm good. I'm good. Uh, they said, we plucking eyebrows and yours look a little unkempt. I said, that's okay. I'm a guy. None of that matters. I like my eyebrows. Uh, maybe some kind of way it'll spread and go up to my hairline. So I, I'm okay. They said, no, it's free. I want you to get in on it. So I said, all right. They said, your skin will be cleaner. You think your skin is clean now. It ain't clean. Come, we're going to show you clean. Sat down in the chair, laid back, and they pull in this mirror real, real close to you. It's a magnifying mirror. Now, I thought, I didn't need no facial. I thought, you know, I'm good. I go to the steam room. I wash my face. I got a buff puff going. Should see my face at 17. I had zits everywhere. Well, I ain't got that many zits these days, so I'm just thanking God this is good enough. When that mirror came in, I saw demons from hell all over my face. I saw dirt I could not see. I saw bumps and lines and 56 years of hard living and all of that was right in front of me. I said, please, please, not just my face, all of me. Wash, wash, cleanse. You got something for this. Do your thing. But then they got, they got another way to take advantage. When I had to, uh, when I had to wrote my first book, they said, you got to go get a photograph taken and it's your author photograph that we're going to put on the back of your book. I said, okay, cool. I went to the photographer and I, uh, uh, the photographer said, stand right here. I said, dang, what is all this stuff you got in here? They had filters that fuzzed out the light and they had stuff that made me look a little more tan than I am. And they had stuff, they said, this thing that I'm putting towards you, that took 10 years off your face right there. This thing is filling you out. This thing is slimming you down. It is less light, more filter. I said, I don't get it. I had a facial, I'm good to go. Just take the picture. They said, no, we're gonna use this. You'll see how much better you get. They took the picture. I said, can I see it? Nope, because after we take the picture, we ain't through with it. We got some retouching to do on the picture. I said, I had a facial. This is a clean face up in here. I'm proud to be the age that I am. They said, nope, you ain't paying for this. They are, so we got the follow procedure. When I got that picture, I said, whose nose is that and whose eyes is that? Look how clear my skin is from this vantage point. I, I, I thought I was high yellow. Uh, I'm cafe au lait up in here. How was it the case? Same Ron, different perspective on Ron. If you see yourself based on, I got to get God to love me, then you are going to spend all your days looking at your zits, warts, flaws, big old uh, knots on your nose. You're going to look at what should be better, but it's not better. We need to see all of that. But what if you can see it in the context of, this ain't something that's going to get him to love me. This is the one who already loves me said, I'm trying to show you lines and crow's feet and zits and blackheads that I've already seen. I loved you ugly. Now will you join me ugly and let me wash you by my power laid out in the chair, the mirror's coming in. It's not putting Vaseline on the camera and gauze on the lights. Since God said, no, we're cleaning some stuff away. But it's taking longer than I wanted it to take. Yeah, when you got that zit two weeks before high school prom, and it took more than two weeks for it to go away, it wasn't gone. But you went anyway, didn't you? So we show up for him to do the cleansing process. Why? Because the number one calling upon our lives is to be recipients of his love. So here's what I want to ask you. If we are recipients of his love, what would that, based on your knowledge of the word of God, based on your experience with God, if we truly said yes to this calling, it says he predestined us for this. It says that he has called us to be recipients of his love. And a big part of being a recipient is more passive than we like. I receive. Oh, yeah, there's a whole bunch of uh, active implications. But the starting place is not something we do. It's something he did. If we were to wrap our brains, our hearts, our minds, our wills, our spirits around that, if we really believed that by faith, that it is not just an optional invitation, it is an eternal calling, what might be different looking in the way you think in the, or the way you act or the way you feel? 
if I really, really wrap my brain around it, and when I say you, I don't mean the body of Christ. I don't mean the gathered saints at the Frank Letterman High School. I mean you personally. What might be different about how you think, how you feel, or what you do? Let me model it. Coming into deeper and deeper belief that God loves me, and boy, has that been a struggle for me. Because, and maybe for you, because over the years, I felt kind of outsider, inadequate, and unlovable. Had a whole lot to do with crazy childhood stuff. So when I became saved at uh, uh, 20 years old, I believe, when I became saved at 20, I rejoiced that God loved me. That was part of what drew me to him. But then it was also difficult for me because I projected onto him. I thought he would find me as weird and strange and inadequate and wrong as I thought. Most people did. And so I just expected that's how he'd see me. And so I tried to get everything as right as I could, quick, fast, and in a hurry, so that he could see me as adequate. But since that time, I am by no means perfect at it. I still trip and got insecurities and inadequacies. But knowing that he loves me means that I can expose more of myself to him. It means that I can just rest in the fact that he loves me and some stuff that went wrong or some stuff that was less than I wanted it to be. I can rejoice now that it doesn't do anything to our relationship at all. It means I'm going to live longer because I'm tripping less and spending less of my mental energy policing myself. So that means I take risks that I wouldn't normally have taken back in the day where I was afraid. There's a lot of them I still say no to. So what is yours? If I really believe that my first calling was to God to love me, either in your actions or your emotions or your, what was the other one I said? Your thoughts. What specifically could be different for you? If I really, really get this. Yes, Marilyn. Ah, you hear that? Repenting, that's very good. I can relate to that. Repenting faster, not having guilt. I don't have to, I, I have a hard time repenting fast because my first thing is, if, if I'm not so clear on that, he loves me, then I'm thinking my guilty crime that I did, and I know I did it, some kind of way is distancing him from me, some kind of way is making the smile go away on his face, some kind of way is make him not want to be with me, and so that's when we start doing all kind of stuff uh, in the interim. I start justifying it. I start talking about, well, it really wasn't my sin. It was just came up because look, at the, look how they did me. Of course, anybody would know if they're going to do you like that, you're going to come like this, and so we go through a whole week, a month, justifying it or not thinking about it. We're going to try to drink it away. We're going to try to serve it away. We're going to try to pray it away. We're going to try to minister to others. You ever try to do that? I don't want to think about what's jacked up with me. So I'm going to come and tell you a word from the Lord about what's jacked up with you. I'm going to lay my hands for your healing because I don't want to think about me. She said, I repent faster. What else? Anybody else? What you got? Yes. Confidence. Confidence. I would have more confidence. And if if I believed he loved me uh, and it was the first, you you do believe he loved you. But if we believe that that was the foundation of everything, I have been called says Ephesians and other places throughout Scripture. I've been called into his love to be a recipient of his love. said I would have more confidence. And with that confidence, I might be apt to what? What might be different if I had that kind of confidence that came from it? To witness more. more. That's one right there. I might be called to witness more. Why? They might think you're a holy roller. And I might think whatever they think of me is their business and not my business. And therefore, I need to stay out of their head And because I'm loved, I get to tell somebody about it enthusiastically, like I did. I love telling y'all about my dating days with Eladrian. Why? Because I just love her so much and believe she loved me. It's natural for me to feel confident. You ain't got to like it. I like it. Stanley said that if I believed I'm loved, I'd be so in love with him that there would be a level of confidence, an increased level of confidence where witnessing would be something I do even more and more effectively. Yes. What does it say in the psalm? I can't remember which psalm. I believe it's 119 where it says, turn away my eyes from looking at worthless things, the psalmist says. The implication being, oh yeah, a man after God's own heart and all that, but yet you can get hung up and distracted looking at worthless things. You ever rear-ended somebody up on the freeway when the traffic slowed down? You know you have. (laughs) You you rear-ended them because you got distracted looking at something on the side of the road. Yes. I have stronger faith. If I really believe God 
love me. That was the starting place. I would have stronger faith. And where there is strong faith, what follows? Greater works. If I really believe he will, you see the connection? The works of God. I have been put here for the works of God. We're going to talk about uh, two, two sermons from now. We're going to be talking about, I believe it's two, two or three. We're going to be talking about that calling to ministry. That's on all of us, not just the reverends among us. If I can't wrap my brain around this first calling, you can believe I ain't saying yes to them other ones. Ministry, I don't even like the sound of that. That scares me. Don't call me no minister. Don't call me no preacher. I'm just a servant of God. As a servant of God, you are a minister of the gospel. And that means the works come from the faith, and the faith at its highest comes from me responding as recipient to the call of God on my life to be beloved by him. He has called us to love, and he has called us to be in his family. We've got to close with this. Look what it says. Ephesians 1, 4 through 5. Long ago, before he made the world, God loved us and chose us in Christ to be holy and without fault. His unchanging plan has always been to adopt us into his own family by bringing us to himself through Jesus Christ. And this gave him pleasure. Him loving us is not something we have to beg him into. It's not something we have to earn him into. It says before you got here, before the world that we sit in got here, he loved us. Why? Because it turns him on. Why does that turn him on? I don't know. We're going to have eternity to ask him all about it. I wouldn't have been turned on. I love you, but I ain't that impressed. Where Before you even got here, I was just jonesing for you. He says it wasn't because that's the only way he's going to save the whole wide world. Nope. For my pleasure. It's not because if I don't have you, then the starving children in Africa are not going to get fed. Nope. And for my pleasure. Not only do I want to love you, I want to love you in a particular kind of way. I don't want to love you like I just love somebody in the next cubicle from me. I want to love you like you are my son or my daughter. It's that kind of love. When you think of it in that way, what are the implications for it? How might I be willing to respond to the rest of the callings? if I am willing to say yes to this calling. Here's some homework I want to give you this week, and you can believe me, there'll be a little bit more in the maturity partnership uh, email tomorrow. I want you to write down in your journal and keep it in the forefront of your mind. I want you to stop two or three times in the day. You might even want to set your cell phone to do this as an alarm, where you stop for about a minute and say, how would what I'm doing at this moment and how I'm feeling thinking at this moment, be different. If I fully said yes to the call of God upon my life to receive his love. So let's say I'm cussing out my boss or listening to my boss cuss me out. The alarm goes off. You ain't got to say, hold on, I got to commune with Jesus right now. You just go right into your secret place and think to yourself, how would I be different in this moment if I really believed and really said yes to the call of God on my life as a recipient of his love. Remember, recipients don't do a whole bunch of stuff it come, or before what they receive. Recipients are good recipients when they what? Humbly accept. Everything else you do after it should come out of the humbly accepting, not instead of. So, Lord... If I were to humbly accept the first calling, and that is you loving me, what might be different? What could be different in this moment? All right? Take a minute. Think that through. At least three times throughout the day. Doesn't matter what the answer is. What we're trying to do, maturity is about repetition, consistency, and conditioning new muscles. We are conditioning some awareness muscles. So just do the dumb stuff, because the dumb stuff will feel dumb, and then you will find out it wasn't dumb at all. If you are willing to be in the shallow, dumb water, it is the way we get to the deep. Exactly right. She said, being a recipient stirs me to want to please him. So not, uh, uh, not to have to, to pay him back for loving me, but on account of him loving me, I am stirred to want to please him. So this is not a matter of receiving instead of giving. No, this is an intimate two-way relationship. This is us getting it locked into our heads about what the starting place is. That's how the enemy is good at lying. Everything in his lies ain't a lie. 
It is a two-way street. The thing that'll deceive us if we get turned around. I got to please him, and that's going to make him love me. Nope, on account of him loving me. So how can I receive, and then how can I respond? That's what recipients do. That's what Academy Award winners do. You don't make the speech until you've grabbed the thing. You, you receive first, and then they respond. Not, I'm going to make the speech. I'll get to that later. Uh, great. Give that to somebody else. I already got one of them. Mm-mm. Tom Hanks, get up there. I don't know. He got 90 of them by now. Every time they pass out one to him, he takes that bad boy. You know, I'm just going to respond and not receive. Receive and respond. Anybody else? Question. Question. 